All right, let's get it going here on Diamond Conversations every single week here on the Place to Be Nation podcasting network. If you didn't know by now, my name is Ian, and every single week we sit down and have a Diamond Conversation with somebody from the world of Major League Baseball, and this week it is no different as we welcome in a great veteran pitcher of the Major League ranks. He pitched for the Royals, he pitched for the Cubs, and he pitched for, of course, my favorite, New York Mets. He is the one and only Mr. Glendon Rush. Mr. Rush. Rush, how are you this evening? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing very good. You're joined here with myself and the producer in the middle, the man with the golden mic, Mr. Doug Barclay. And we are, uh, we're thrilled to have you on. It's, uh, it's always great to catch up with, uh, with, with somebody like yourself. But uh, what's going on with you today and how's everything going in your world? Everything's good. I'm, uh, I'm constantly trying to stay busy here. I've been, I've been doing some fun stuff with the guys at uh, Bet America. Uh, the online uh, sports book for owned by Churchill Downs. Um, and they put together this cool game called Beat the Rush. So uh, I pick five games a day. It's all free. Um, and so I'm constantly watching and paying attention to who's playing and who's winning and everything else now. So I, I didn't used to do that as much. I just kind of watched more of a, as a, uh, just a fan and a, obviously an ex-player, but so now I'm I'm into it more. I'm I'm paying attention to who's doing what and, and everything else. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, the season's been a little different. I, I think we can all agree on that. It's been something to uh, to definitely check out. So I don't know. I'm not I'm not into the betting world, and I clicked on the site, and I don't even know if my state allows the betting to uh, to even go on. But how is it like kind of looking at these games from a player's point of view? Is it harder to see these matchups because? You know, some games are seven innings. You know, some pl- pitchers don't pitch in their five-day rotation. How has this been kind of checking out this new baseball landscape? Uh, I think a ton relies on who's hot, who's not. Uh, the pitching is big. Um, but I'm a complete novice. I don't I don't know it at all other than uh, just following the game. And I kind of go off of uh, my gut feeling of who did what the day before and, and – um, you know, the beauty of the game that I'm doing is it doesn't matter at all whether I pick the winners or pick the losers. Everyone's playing off me, so uh, and it's all for fun. Um, they can win cash prizes, but uh, it's free to play. No, it's really cool. You know, I've seen the clips popping on through your Twitter feed, and it's uh, it's cool when you have a couple of, you know, your former colleagues and uh, teammates on the uh, on the airwaves with you. So have you enjoyed being able to catch up with teammates through the, uh, the Bet America portal? It's been awesome. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and, and, and having some guys too, that I, um, don't really necessarily know as, as teammates or, um, uh, more, more like guys I played against. I'm actually, uh, I actually, I'm having Kevin Euclid on tomorrow, which is going to be fun. He's such oh, a, nice. a great personality and, and great player. And, you know, we competed against each other a little bit, but we're never teammates. Yeah, I watch a lot of the interactions on Twitter are very, uh, very fun between the former players. And it seems like we've talked about it with a couple different guests. The the former players have kind of banded together here and uh, have taken on a lot of the gurus and a lot of the uh, the outsiders for the baseball world. So uh, the camaraderie uh, has gone from the uh, the locker room to the Twitterverse and beyond. So that's uh, it's always fun to watch you guys interact. Oh, well, there's no doubt the guys are banded <laughs> together. They're they're taking on everybody. It's funny. I. I I get a big kick out of reading through the comments every day and seeing who's arguing with who about hitting, about pitching, about baseball in general, about uh, analytics, everything. Everybody's all over everybody. So it's, it's, it's good. As long as it's in good fun, I'm cool with it. So where do you kind of fall in that debate with the analytics and the progression of where the game has gone? I mean, I can put on the MLB network and I don't really know sometimes what they're talking about. Now, Doug in the middle does, and he follows it very closely, but where do you kind of fall into that realm of the, uh, the analytical world? I love the information. I wish I had more info probably when I was playing. Uh, there's more available now than there ever has been. I, I also think you can get overloaded with information, um, as a, especially as a pitcher. Um, and a hitter too, you know, you going up to the plate and thinking about too many things, but it, it, when you compete, once you cross those lines and, it, and it's time for the lights to turn on and the game to go, you're not thinking about any of that stuff. You're thinking about competing at bat to at bat and pitch to pitch as a pitcher. So it's got to be kind of a combo of both of those put together. And, and I think, uh, I think, it, you know, the biggest battle you have now is the new school versus old school, right? That's what everybody's talking about. And, you know, we're all dinosaurs because we played 20 years ago. And, and <laughs> guys before us were dinosaurs because they played 20 years before us. But, look, the game hasn't changed. The players have. The way it's played a little bit has. Um, 
guys are probably bigger, stronger, faster now than ever. Um, there's more home runs than ever. Guys throw harder than ever, but the game is always going to be the same. And there's so many beautiful things about it and the nuances and um, kind of the, the, I guess, emotional swings back and forth within a game. All, all those things that you don't really think about that analytics don't cover, those, those all come into play too. And you would go back 20 years and you'd think it was more about, you know, video analysis back then and things going more digital and people have, you know, the chance to put things on a laptop rather than have you sit in a film room and watch the tape of yesterday's game. But were you a, uh, were you a video guy? Did you watch the, uh, the at bats and the, uh, you know, the different sequences? I did. And, and, you know, it doesn't take a lot for, for a guy like me to go back. And if, if I didn't watch a ton of, um, my film back, what I did is I, I watched a lot of other left-handed guys somewhat similar to me facing the lineups I was going to face. Um, I think that helped me more than anything. As far as me watching my film and my mechanics, my mechanics are pretty much all the same throughout my career. Um, if I gave up hits, gave up homers, generally they're not good pitches. Um, you know, you get there's an occasional one here or there that's you make a pretty good pitch and a guy hits it, but they're mostly mistakes, right? That's what guys hit. And you leave it out over the plate or you're trying to come in and you leave it middle in and it gets hammered. I mean, you don't have to go back on video to watch that. I'm sure there were guys too at that point though that were still kind of opposed to changes going on, right? With having to to see a lot of those digital mechanics being brought forward. Was there like opposition? Because I mean, I remember, you know, the quest text of the world and that, that kind of uh, things that were kind of debated. Were there people opposed at that point too to having to watch too much video or, or look at things like, you know, like I'm saying, uh, you know, go back and watch a file of an at-bat? Yeah, I think there is. I think um, it started maybe with some of the older school coaching uh, guys around the league. I think I think they've probably been slower to adapt than anybody. The, the, you know, the new generation of players, especially the guys now, they, these guys have had most all this stuff when they've been playing in high school and college. They've had the showcases and, uh, you know, rap soto and everything else that, that's out there to, to kind of give them measurements and quantify what they're doing. So I think that the coaches have – probably taking a little bit longer to come around, but uh, th those guys, look, they either they either adapt or they die. I, I think that's kind of the point we're at now in 2020. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, 2020, 20 years removed from uh, the 2000 Mets. We're going to get into that, but let's go back to the beginning of your career. Let's talk about the minor leagues. The minor leagues, you know, this year we saw the minor league uh, season get canceled and these players, you know, have either gone off to play an independent ball or they're, you know, working with their scouts or working with other coaches inside the organizations. What was your minor league experience like back in the 90s? D did you enjoy it? Was it uh, the bus rides that you didn't like? What, what did you think about your minor league years? I honestly loved all of it. Um, and, and probably from being a little bit naive, I, I went into it thinking that, you know, signing with the Royals and coming out of high school and being a professional baseball player, as far as I was concerned, I was in the big leagues when I was in rookie ball. That, that's what I felt like. I felt like that's how, <laughs> that's, that's how important it was to me. So um, I loved every bit of it. I loved the guys that I got to meet along the way. I have lifelong buddies that I met um, playing in the Royals organization that we still talk to this day and uh, riding the buses, going through all those cities and grinding it out and, and coming up. It, it really makes you appreciate, uh, if you are lucky enough to, to get a chance to be a big leaguer, it really makes you appreciate being a big leaguer and what you what you did to get there and, and all the guys you came along with that, that have made it as well. What was the first stop on the minor league journey? I went to Gulf Coast League uh, with the Royals in, in you know the, the rookie ball, and then I went to the Midwest League in Rockford, then I went to Wilmington, Delaware in the Carolina League, and then I skipped Double A, which is kind of odd, actually, on on the ladder. But went to Triple A Omaha, and then the following year made it made the big league team in Kansas City. Yeah, absolutely. Now we have Doug jump in here. He's gonna uh, he's gonna pick it up whenever uh, there he is. Quick question uh, for you, Glennon. Yeah. Uh, so talk about you know the differences between you know your time. Uh, you know, so you kind of hit the minor leagues at three different times. You know, you're there. The early 90s, the beginning of your career, uh, you make a stop down uh, towards the end of your career when you're uh, in 2008, and then you coach in the minor leagues. So can you talk about some of the biggest differences over the generations that you saw three very different uh, versions of minor league baseball, perhaps? I did. I, I, um, my, I guess probably my AAA year in 1996 in Omaha, 
is when I saw the generation of 90s big league baseball players that were that were in AAA. You know, I had a, a veteran guys on, on our team in Omaha that year, tons of them that had already been in the big leagues. And then going back in, in uh, 2008, I spent a little bit of time there at the beginning of the year in 2004. Then it was um, a little bit younger generation of players uh, you know, going 10 and 12 years later that, that it, it was kind of the upcoming prospects and a couple veteran guys. But then I was in that boat. I was considered a veteran guy at that point. So it definitely changed. And then, and then when I came back in 2015, 16 and 17 with the Padres and, and coached in the uh, California league, I think that the talent level is just amazing. Now, when you look at each draft that comes through and you go down to instructional league and they bring in all the high school and college drafts, as well as the international signs. Um, every year, you're just amazed at, at, at the talent that was there. I saw saw Fran Mill Reyes as a you know 18 year old kid over there in San Diego, watching him hit balls over the light towers. And I, and I, I mean, and and the the pitching um, that we got in those drafts with Quantrill and Lauer and Lucchese and Winganer, all all those guys. Um, uh, that that kind of came up through that system. It's been fun to watch them now all be big league players. And obviously they're like, a, you know, they were the hidden gem of this uh, this shortened season is watching them progress. And they seem like, even though it took them a little while to kind of get going, like they were the gem of this whole thing is, is seeing the fun they're having. And you got to see, you know, some of these guys, you know, from an earlier uh, age in the development. Oh, it's cool that, that you know, they, they, uh, they did it the right way and it's not easy to do it that way. It's not easy to build an organization which you consider, you know, they're a, they're a smaller market team, um, but to really uh, scout and draft and develop the way they have with what um, AJ Preller's done and, and Sam Ganey, the minor league director, and all the guys that I worked with over there. Mark Pryor was the pitching coordinator at the time, along with um, Eric Jung and Gor- Gorman Heimuller. Those guys, they, they put together such a great um, developmental system from, the draft through instructional league and, and, and taking those guys up the minor league system, you, you knew you were going to have an abundance of talent. And then what happens is you have the opportunity to use a bunch of those chips to go out and get guys that you want. And that, so when you saw uh, AJ make all those trades this year and make those splashes to add to that team um, all at once, uh, that that's what happens when you, when you're patient and you keep all those uh, high prospects in your organization. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, beautiful city, great baseball city, a great history. You know, maybe this is the year. It might. It's an odd year, but maybe this is the one, and everybody will remember that, be uh, be because of it. But how was Glendon Rush the coach versus Glendon Rush the player in the minor leagues? Did you take things that you learned all the way back in the the mid '90s and be able to foster that to uh, you know be in there in the uh, the mid 2000s or two, 2010s? I did. I think I was pretty similar, um, pretty even keel. Uh, you know, never got never got too high, never got too low. Um, I, I, I prided myself on being a good communicator and, and hopefully, you know, made the kids feel like that uh, I was on the same level as them as far as still being vulnerable. And, and you kind of have to wear a bunch of hats as a coach, right? You got to be a coach, a mentor, a big brother, a father figure. You know, you kind of have to be all of the above, especially in the minor leagues, helping those guys through that tough grind. And they go through a lot and, and you know, they don't make a lot of money and they're they play every single day and it's 140 game season in the same span as what the big leaguers play in 162. Um, you know, they're doing that in, in five months and the big leaguers do it in six. So it's a tough long road and they have to really be mentally prepared for it. And most of them aren't because they've never been through it before. No matter what they did in high school or college, they're not prepared for that season. Who was your mentor when you were going through? Uh, I had a few in, in Kansas City. Um, I had a left-handed um, pitching coach named Tom Bergmeier and uh, and a manager named John Miserock that, that kind of helped me through the uh, minor league system over there. But I had great coaches. That was a great organization. Kansas City is first class and always has been, and they treated me really, really well. And, and in fact, uh, got to the point where they ended up trading me to the Mets. They, they traded me away to kind of give me an opportunity somewhere else, which is – not necessarily uh, a normal way to do it. It was, it was pretty nice of them. Yeah. And you know, and that trade, I mean, I was trying to remember in the timeline without cheating and going right to baseball reference and seeing the actual time. I didn't remember it being that late in the season. So it was basically within the last two and a half weeks uh, of the season, you're traded to a team that's in a pennant race and chasing for the wild card 
But, you know, there's nothing you could really do outside of, of watching it. So when you got traded to New York and they're in the midst of all this this craziness, the city was ready to explode and get behind them. But, you know, you're coming in literally in the closing weeks of the season. Yeah, it was uh, it was an experience, to say the least. I went from small market Kansas City to the Big Apple under the lights in the middle of a pennant race and joined a, an extreme veteran team. I mean, they, the, oh, yeah. the, you know, the, the starting pitchers were Al Leiter, Kenny Rogers, Oral Hershiser, um, you know, Rick Reed. Uh, they, they, it was it was really neat experience for me. And those guys were so good to me and kind of helped me along. And, and yeah, I was a spectator. I pitched one inning in the uh, regular season portion of it. And then uh, obviously wasn't available for the playoffs, but got to be there and, and see it and be a part of it. And then I think that probably helped me from an experience point of you know point of view for the next season. I think there's a long debate whether that '99 team or the 2000 team you know could have had the uh, the distance, but we saw the 2000 team have the you know the distance and go to the World Series. And again, it's 20 years ago, and that like that blows my mind. I was a senior in high school in 2000, so I lived and died with every pitch, every inning, every every hit, every blood, sweat, and tear that went into it. But that Subway Series, I mean, that's that hasn't been duplicated since, and who knows when it will be. But talk about that season and how special it was for you. It was exciting. The, the whole thing from, from start to finish, for me going into spring training as a, as a candidate to be a fifth starter, making the team, winning that job, and then, and then essentially proving myself and, and being there and being a part of it that whole season and making all my starts. And, and, and then in you know, playoff time, I ended up being in the bullpen and, and helping out there. And at that point in time, I really didn't know that that's the way it was going to happen. But Bobby V uh, believed in me that I was going to be – a bigger help out of the bullpen than I would as a starter, which was awesome. You had a great postseason. I mean, and it, and it, especially in the World Series, where I think you had your most appearances in the World Series. I mean, every one of those games were were tight, and 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 we can argue until the cows come home. If you guys win Game One, th- it's a whole different series. And you know, we know a few things didn't happen, but that's all right. We can get over that now. But it, do you think that if you guys win Game One, the 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 series is completely different? Game one was huge. You know, I tell I tell uh, people all the time that that was one of the probably the coolest, most exciting appearances I ever had in my career. That I wish I never had was the one in game one. I ended up I ended up in that game in the in the a tie game in the tenth inning uh, after Armando gave up the run in the ninth, and Dennis Cook started the tenth, and I ended up coming in for him and getting out of a jam, but. You know what? A, what an amazing experience for me. But I wish it never happened. I wish it never happened because I, you know, I wish we won that game in the ninth and it was over with. But I absolutely agree that series is different if we win Game One. Look, we lost four games by a total of five runs. Yeah, and their bullpen was essentially unhittable. We we scraped, I think, three runs off Rivera in one of the games. Yes, with Peyton Homer. But other yeah, than that, Game Two. Yeah, other than that, you know, with Stanton and, and Nelson and Rivera, we, we, we couldn't score. So the minute they took a one-run lead, it, it was over. It's unbelievable. But the intensity of that rivalry in 2000, obviously at its peak, you know, the stuff that happened with uh, Piazza earlier in the season. Did you guys feel that intensity turned up to 100 every time you took the uh, the field against the Yankees? Oh, it was up. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. We, we, we had a huge rivalry, and, and especially to be in that city under that microscope and, and have the quality of teams on, on, uh, you know, on both sides of the city like we did, it was really cool. And, and, and I think it was, um, you know, it got more heated as we went along with the stuff that went on with Mike and, and Roger and, and just in general. It was just constantly, you know, how many fights were there going to be in the stands during the games <laughs> at both the stadiums? So it was, it was crazy. Any other stadium in the world, the fans are reaching over and grabbing that ball, but the the ball that Todd Zeal hits off the wall, nobody grabbed it. They just let it hit the padding and come back. But that that's Yankee Stadium for you. <laughs> I've watched that one so many times, and and I know I, I was just with Todd, and we were down in spring training a little bit right before they shut everything down for COVID, and I spent some time with him. And, yeah, we look back on that, and it's just heartbreaking to watch because – not only does it not go out for a homer, but then Timo gets thrown out at home. And yeah, that's a, that's a gut punch. Oh, man. I mean, I swear, like, I had every World Series hat you guys had, three different hats. So, I mean, it was, we were happy to have you there, but, you know, it could have gone a different way. We would have loved that. But I digress. How about Bobby V as a leader? I mean, obviously, you said as a veteran team, you know, he's known for, for having some different, uh, you know, 
characteristics maybe than other managers. So how was it playing under Bobby Valentine? Love Bobby. I had a great time with him. He he treated me extremely well. I mean, he helped me find a place to live during the season. He was he was really really good to me, and and uh, I got to catch up with him earlier this year. We did a, a fun little zoom chat with uh howie rose and and bobby and todd zeal and it was awesome he's doing great and you know i i was honored to play for him i i got to play for some awesome managers and and i i liked all of them and and respected all of them but bobby v is one of the best dusty baker is probably my favorite of all time as well i i, I really love playing for dusty yeah, you got. I mean, you hit. You know, great baseball cities. I mean, it seemed like every place that you you landed, it just had a rich history and it had a, a great fan base. But before we move on, talk about some of the, those other teams. That two thousand one Mets team is another one that had the what ifs up the you know up the wazoo, and of course it had the dramatic and compelling, and we still talk about it every year. The the Piazza home run, the nine eleven game. You shared the picture online of uh, Mike, I believe Ray Ordonez, and then yourself in the lineup. Can you just kind of take us back to that night and talk about the emotion uh, going out on the field? Yeah. The, I mean, the emotion was kind of hard to describe. I mean, there was so much sorrow and sadness and, and I think, I think all of us were overwhelmed honestly of, of, of what was, what happened and what was going on. And I don't know if anybody knew whether or not we, we should be out there or not, but I think, I think once we all were there and got out there and, for the anthem and and everything happened, I, I think it was it, it was then as that game started to progress, um, we all knew we needed to be there and and to see some a little bit of a little bit of hope, a little bit of joy uh, for the Mets fans, for for baseball fans, for people of New York. I think it was um, so special. And then to have Mike do what he did, I mean, I, I love watching that highlight. I've seen it so many times, and I love watching the interview. Uh, of Mike and 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 all the people that were involved and and it's awesome. You feel every time you see the pitch, you feel the emotion the, as the ball's ascending, and it felt like the ball would never stop. <laughs> it just kept going up into that second level of the photo deck out there in, in left center field. Just uh, an absolute, you know, it was a, a piazza like shot, but just uh, amazing to see that every year, you know, when we're approaching, um, you know, the twentieth anniversary of it. So it's just it's crazy, but that team. Is that close? Uh, that 2001 Mets team, you guys were right there, and it just unfortunately fell apart. Yeah, we that that was a good team, and you know, we I, I wish we could have pulled it together. We made one heck of a run. Uh, oh yeah, the end, and it, and it kind of crumbled on us. But man, we we went from I don't remember how many games exactly we were out at one point, but we we got it down to like two and a half or three games out, and I and I thought we were going to roll our way back into it, but we just weren't able to do it. Yeah, it's it's one of those what if teams because there was such a run, but it was such a, a an amazing you know season where it went and how you guys then stepped in and the Mets played such a key part in the the rebuilding of of people and and helping out during the the you know the afterwards uh, days after nine eleven. So I mean you know kudos to everyone on the team uh, for that. But you know that trade then that sent you out of New York was like a who's who of guys. It was an amazing amount of people traded. But then you're traded to Milwaukee, which again another great baseball city. But now you're going there as somebody who pitched in a World Series and was a part of a playoff run. How was the transition into Milwaukee? The transition was great. Uh, the, the, those guys um, on that staff were awesome. Unfortunately, we we played so poorly. We got Davey Lopes fired early into the season. Uh, Dave Stewart was our pitching coach. Stu was great. Um, and then he left partway through the season as well. Um, so it was a little bit of chaos over there. But, you know, then the following year, we uh, we um, brought in Ned Yost into the you know big league managing world, who, who ended up obviously being a great big league manager and, and won the world series for the Royals later on down the road. And, but I enjoyed my time in Milwaukee. I love that trade. Uh, I actually got, I love that Burnitz was in that trade because <laughs> so Jeremy and I, uh, a couple of years later then joined up uh, in Chicago as Cubs together and became best of buddies. And we're still, you know, it's one of my dearest friends out of baseball to this day. And funny, we, we always joke around about getting traded for each other. We played against each other and, uh, so it's pretty cool. That was quite the trade. <laughs> and Bernitz, I mean, look, he still had some great days, uh, you know, some days where with the Mets, but that that whole year, everybody just fell apart uh, for the Mets. So, you know, it was sad to see you go. Great to see him come back, but just was not, uh, that wasn't, the, the trade didn't work out the way I think a lot of people thought it was. <laughs> no, I don't think anybody was necessarily <laughs> happy with that one on either end. Not without a doubt. 
But, you know, we, we then see how you, you know, you go from Milwaukee to the Cubs. And again, Cubs, another great baseball city, another great history. Uh, so talk about the Cubs organization, if you can, and going from, you know, kind of a heated rival there, the Brewers, right into the heart of Chicago. Yeah, you know, I I was uh, I, I had a rough season in in '03 in Milwaukee and had to go into spring training in '04 as a non roster invite for the Rangers uh, and and threw the ball pretty well in Rangers camp and thought I had a chance to make that team and they told me on the last day that I wasn't going to make their opening day roster so I took my release and signed the same day actually with the Cubs and went over there and threw an inning for the Cubs in spring training. And then started the season in Iowa, and it took me a couple weeks, two or three weeks. And uh, their GM at the time was Jim Hendry, terrific baseball guy, and 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 loved Jim. And he basically said, "Hey, go to go to Iowa, throw the ball for a little bit, and if I don't call you up uh, in the first month of the season, I'll I'll give you your release and you can go somewhere else." Which is pretty awesome and and a you know really respectful move that that he did. And they called me up, and I ended up having you know uh, a couple solid years there in in Chicago and. I, I struggled a little bit in 06 and then in 07, um, at the end of 06, I had a blood clot. Uh, I had a pulmonary embolism, oh, wow. which is a blood clot in your lung. And I ended up missing the rest of 06 and all of 07, which I was signed there for. So, which really bummed me out because I was looking forward to playing for Lou Pinella at some point because I've heard plenty of beautiful stories about him and <laughs> being in his clubhouse. So I thought that would have been fun. And I, I love those guys. They're had so much fun with the, Cubs guys and a bunch of them are still my longtime buddies to this day, Dempster and Kerry Wood and Pryor and everybody. So that was a lot of fun. Glenn and Doug here in the middle. Uh, I was on mute before and I was talking to myself, but one quick question about the Brewers. There's one game that uh, I, I looked up, you know, when I was looking at some of your stats. Do you remember April 5th, 2002 at all? I'm, I'm assuming that was the – was that the home opener that I pitched? Home opener, you throw nine inning, complete games, and you hit a home run. And go deep. That's the, yeah, that's, a, that's called a Little League <laughs> box score. <laughs> but, yeah, there's nothing better than that. I talk about that one all the time. That's a lot of fun. I always ask uh, – I love asking uh, kids that I coach. I, I'll, I'll coach uh, – my boys are 16 and 12, so sometimes I help help out with their team. So I'll, like, walk up and down the dugout and say, any, any of you kids throwing a uh, – Complete game on a and a home opener and gone deep before and then just keep walking and see <laughs> see what they say. That's and great. you should add again, the reigning World Series champions. I mean, not a, an easy lineup for the day. No, at all. They were, yeah, they were good. They were good. We, you know what? I think the best thing that happened to me is I, I think I missed uh, Randy Johnson and Schilling on that rotation. I think I faced Rick Helling, which yeah. was a was a heck of a pitcher uh, in his own right, but not not maybe as tough as those other guys. <laughs> And then how about, let's see, so you hit the home run. As a pitcher, you know, I, I think you could say uh, if a pitcher could, he'd slot himself in the lineup a couple days a week. Was it, was it everything that, uh, you know, you wanted it to be? <laughs> oh, my gosh. There's nothing better. Yeah. <laughs> I, ended up, I ended up hitting a couple more. I, I hit uh, I hit two more in Chicago, and I hit I actually hit two in AAA. So I got, I got five total homers, uh, professional homers under my belt. <laughs> we call that busted out the whooping stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's nothing like it. Hitting, hitting homers is one of the, no doubt, the best highlights of my career. So, all right, well, we're going to bring Doug. Games? What's that? Do you have any of your home run balls? I do. I think I have, um, I think I have two or two of the three in the, from the big leagues. Yeah. A guy actually from Chicago sent me um one of my home run balls and and like the game his game ticket which was really cool oh, so wow. I, I sent him some stuff back yeah it was awesome because you know those are lost in the abyss when they go into the bleachers in chicago oh yeah you just want to make sure that that's the right ball though we, we yeah, need the mlb point. authenticator to get in here and make sure that's not just a ball from a little league field rubbed in some dirt <laughs> yeah it's probably like a wilson little league i didn't pay attention <laughs> you're just like wow there it is did, yeah. did al Leiter teach you everything you knew about how to hit Oh my gosh, Al's the greatest. I we had so much fun. I just reconnected um, with him the other day. We were talking uh, because I was down in Nashville and I was I was out on my uh, daily walk, and so I was walking through the Vanderbilt campus, and and it made me think of him. So I I texted him and uh, asked how he was doing, and obviously his son Jack's there, and Jack's yeah. a stud. And Jack was a baby when we were together, so crazy to think about how old these kids are getting now. 
Yeah, the lighter brothers, their sons are uh, are, are starting to dominate. Uh, you know, the the world, kind of like how uh, they they made their mark. <laughs> so yeah. it's pretty uh, it's pretty interesting how it comes uh, comes full circle. It is cool. Yeah, see those those uh, genes, man. They got you know, look at Toronto. They got three guys in the big leagues right now that are that are all sons of big leaguers that grew up in clubhouses. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So before we head into the wrap up, we bring Doug back here for the uh, the Glendon Rush trivia portion of the show before we uh, we say goodbye. So, Doug, uh, what do you have cooking and brewing in the uh, the kitchen tonight? So I've, I've got a few questions for you, Glennon, just kind of see uh, how much of your own personal history you remember. Okay. Going through your stats, can you tell me who had the most hits off you of any batter you faced in your major league career? I would say... Oh, middle maybe, infielder. Maybe Pujols. Not Pujols. Pujols has 13 hits. This guy has 18 hits and 44 at bats. Ooh, Ooh, that's a killer. <laughs> He's killing me. I don't know who it is. Edgar Renteria. Oh yeah, Edgar oh, killed wow. me. <laughs> now on the other end of the spectrum, you struck out many many guys in your careers. You struck out Adam Dunn 10 times. He's the guy you struck out the second most. Do you know who you struck out more times than anyone in your big league career? I'll give you a hint. He was a teammate of Edgar Renteria. I'd say Jim Edmonds. Jim Edmonds is correct. What was it about <laughs> facing Jim Edmonds? <laughs> uh, I think, well, first of all, I think I faced him a ton of times, maybe, maybe 40, 50 times. Um, I, I think I just got the best of him sometimes. I don't think he saw the ball that well off me because we, we eventually were teammates for a little bit in San Diego in, in uh, 2008, and he, and he made some comments to me saying he couldn't see the ball that well off me, which is odd because it seemed like everybody else in the league could see it fine. And you're actually right. You faced Jim Edmonds more than you faced anybody in your career. And going through some of the some of the names on here, uh, one guy kind of stuck out uh, about who really uh, you had to, or had some trouble with you. Can you talk about Mike Lowell? Mike Lowell went three for twenty six with seven strikeouts against Glendon Rush. I heard there was a segment on MLB Network one day when he was doing some commentating and he told those guys on on one of the live shows that that i absolutely wore him out and he couldn't he couldn't do anything against me which was pretty funny because i i always felt like he was a dangerous hitter when i faced him i didn't really realize that that i got him out as much as i did but man i always felt like he was going to do some damage so i'm, I'm glad i held him down absolutely just so you know, one of those strikeouts of Jim Edmonds did come in game four of the NLCS in 2000. So not only did you strike out Jim Edmonds, but yeah, clutch struck out Jim Edmonds. <laughs> that was good. That was a good outing. I, that was, uh, I, I think the coolest part of that was I remember w when you're a kid, you watch the post game interviews from the, from the, uh, you know, the ALCS, NLCS world series. And, I remember them bringing me down saying, hey, they want to bring you in the press room after game four of that. When I got the W, I was like, that's pretty cool. That's something you look at as a kid and go, I'd love to do that someday. Oh, that's awesome. That was a great, uh, that was a great NLCS, man. That was a roller coaster. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, uh, but, you know, Jay Payton getting hit there at the end. It seemed like everybody was going to uh, go nuts, but uh, held in check. And then there's Timo jumping to catch the uh, that final out and all the, the rest is history. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, let's head into the wrap up here. Of course, it's time of conversations. You've been listening to us for about the last half hour or so. Whatever else you got going on in the world, Glendon, please share with us. You know, the, the Bet America, you know, the 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 different kind of uh, viewing we've seen you, interviewing your teammates. Tell us what you got going on and where all the uh, listeners can find you. That's all. I, you know, I've been doing all my stuff with um, with Bet America and, and we've been uh, doing the rush hour Zoom chats with uh, ex-teammates. Um, had Tom Morello on, guitar player from Rage Against the Machine. Nice. I've had um, uh, upcoming. I have Kevin Euclid and uh, Randy Johnson is coming on. Uh, oh wow! So I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna interview the Big Unit, which I'm really excited about because I grew up in Seattle and I, you know, I watched him as a young player coming up, and then obviously competed against him. We never went head to head. Thank God I didn't have to get in the box against him. <laughs> but uh, that's pretty cool. So yeah, I'm looking forward to. Uh, just continuing to do that. I love connecting with fans and, and baseball people on Twitter and, and uh, across social media. So it's a lot of fun. 
And it's at Glendon Rush on Twitter if you want to follow uh, Mr. Rush and see all the Bet America greatness. And now stay tuned for the big unit. Hey, call in Joe McEwen if you need to, uh, to to have a sub out there to get a hit off of Randy Johnson. <laughs> Super Joe. I love seeing Super Joe in that Chicago White Sox dugout. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. All right, well, we're going to say goodbye for this week. If you want to follow me, it's at Chad EMB. If you want to follow the man in the middle, Doug Barclay, it's at Doug Barclay 17. And, of course, this was another great conversation here around the baseball diamond. So we will see you next time on Diamond Conversations.